low content publishing, the latest way to make money on Amazon that doesn't require any inventory investment and potentially very little writing. Stick around to hear how it works. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to this Side Hustle show because sometimes it's not about finding customers for your products. Sometimes it's about making products for your customers. Hat tip to Seth Godin for that one. And it's an appropriate lead in to today's episode because we're exploring a new way to let customer demand drive your direction. Specifically, I'm excited to introduce one of the hottest side hustles of the moment, and that is low content self publishing. Let me explain what I mean by that. So, self publishing has been around for a decade, and we've covered that quite a bit on the show, both in fiction and nonfiction. It's one of my favorite and perhaps most passive side hustles. Write the book. Hit publish, collect royalties for years. Cool, right? Well, it's the whole write the book part where a lot of people get stuck. You might not know what to write about. And even if you do, it can be a really time consuming process. And still, at the end of the day, it might not turn out to be a huge seller on Amazon. What low content publishing aims to accomplish is to accelerate your product creation by focusing on a very specific subset of books journals, diaries, planners notebooks, sketchbooks, stuff like that, where the value doesn't come from your years of experience and a 35,000 word brain dump, but rather from how you've structured the mostly blank internal pages and prompts, and then who you're targeting as your customer. With Amazon's print on demand KDP print service, you can upload these products as digital files. That means you don't have to hold any physical inventory, and then you collect passive royalties whenever they sell. But there's an art and a science to it, like every side hustle, and that's why I've assembled a panel of experts in today's show. The first voice you'll hear is Rob Cubbin from robcubbin.com. Longtime listeners might remember Rob from episode 81 back in 2014. Rob's been in the low content game for the last year or so, and in that time has published over 1,000 titles. It was actually reading Rob's blog on the topic that partially inspired me to create the Progress Journal last year, a print-on-demand paperback productivity journal. Next is Flav Medeiros from SideBusinessLaunch.com. Flav was a guest on episode 300 of the Side Hustle Show last summer, where we were talking about his print-on-demand merch business, t-shirt business. But since then, he's expanded to the self-publishing space with around 300 titles so far, And he's actually been able to repurpose a lot of his designs and niches from the merch business to build up that portfolio. And third is Rachel Harrison Sund from rachelharrisonsund.com. Rachel built her low content business to six figures a year on a very part-time basis. But as you'll hear in this episode, there's uh, some seasonality that comes into play. There are some competitive factors that come into play. And there is a little bit of a gold rush feel to all of this especially because there's so little overhead and risk. That's something I asked the panel to address in this episode as well. But stick around to hear how these low content publishers go about their product research so they don't waste their time, how they price and market their books to maximize sales and royalties, and how they manage such a wide ranging portfolio of titles. Notes and links for this one, plus the free downloadable PDF highlight reel are at sidehustlenation.com slash low, L-O-W. We kick this one off with a discussion on the keyword research or niche selection process for low content publishing, and I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with Rob, Flav, and Rachel after the interview. Oh, and if you're listening with little ones, just a heads up, there are a few S words in this episode where it didn't make sense to bleep because it was actually the title of the book we were talking about. Ready? Let's do it. You know, I tried so many things, and It's annoying because like everything works at at first. I actually started with merchant words, which was something I had over from the FBA days. And I don't know if you know about that. It's it's quite a good sort of Amazon keyword guessing machine. And I just did notebook and and journal and saw what came up. And and then I just like astronomy notebook came out and DJ notebook came up. And at the beginning, I was just trying everything. Just the idea would pop into my head, I'd try it. I'd get the ideas from, from that merchant words, but it doesn't have to be merchant words. It can be Pinterest, Redbubble, the ideas, the niches you get from the merch game. It just can be anything. And then you can just look on Amazon 
and type in logbook or notebook with a another noun. And uh, I, I got an idea this morning because a friend of mine showed me a book about parrots. And in the book, it said, you must keep a log of all your parrots. And sure enough, parrot logbook is a thing. So I, they just come from it. And your friends, your friends are really good, actually, because if you find someone who's got some um, knowledge about a certain niche, and they can really help you with an interior of a book. Okay, so you're going to mention the logbooks, the one-line-a-day type of journals, the planners. Are there any other types of products you found to work well? There's so many. Notebook, journal, logbook, planner, diary. Sketchbooks, music books. Yeah, I mean, the list is absolute. And there'll be ones that we haven't even thought of yet that are out there. Yeah, I, I think to piggyback what Rob said, I normally like to tell people to start with what you know about, kind of like merch when it comes to designs. If you're an avid dog lover or you train dogs and all that, do dog training journals and other similar things like that. If you're really into sports, you can find plenty of sport-related books you can do, stat books and things like that. So there's so much, so much you can do. And I also take it from Google. Like if somebody is searching Amazon for something, chances are they stopped at Google first. Uh, on phones, the default is to search Google. So I like using Neil Patel's tool that Uber suggests. It's a great free tool. Go in there and I just search and get some keyword ideas and volume. And I figure if somebody is typing it into Google, chances are there's demand for it and they're typing it into Amazon. And then like Rob said, I'll just kind of confirm by going over to Amazon and, and checking there. I think I use the AMZ Expander, Suggestion Expander, and it just kind of brings up a whole lot of different auto-suggest options on Amazon. So that's kind of how I do it to get some ideas when I'm kind of fresh out of ideas. Okay, so Merchant, Merchant Words is a premium tool. Uber Suggest is a free tool. And the AMZ Suggestion Expander, I think, is a free Chrome extension, yes? Yes. Okay, cool. So that as you type in seed keywords into Amazon, it'll kind of guess or populate what people are often typing in before and after that word. Yes. Yep. Okay. My niche selection, I mean, it's it's pretty much the same as Robin Flav's. Like, mostly I browse Amazon or just the internet in general. Sometimes I'm actually at a bookstore and I just, you know, check out what's selling in terms of journals and notebooks. Sometimes I just brainstorm. And then the other thing is I really just try and think about current trends or memes or popular expressions and things like that. Like, what's in the language right now? Some of the best success I've had is just putting kind of catchphrases that are in common usage right now in the language. So it's really interesting to hear, you know, like millennial speak and stuff like that. Like people love anything that's kind of funny or snarky or cheeky or anything like that. I've had a lot of success with whatever it is, a journal or whatever, just putting one of those kind of catchphrases on there. So that's where I've had a lot of success and where I, I, I kind of try to hone in on as well. <laughs> Can you share an example of that? Yeah, well, okay, the biggest one for me was Get Shit Done. Last year, I had a Get Shit Done daily planner, and that book alone brought in anywhere from between six and $11,000 a month for several months, probably four or five months. Wow. It's so funny because we're both saying, so that's you. <laughs> so now when you go on there, I mean, there's probably three or 400 or probably even more books that say Get Shit Done. And I think that one's kind of been, it's been done now. <laughs> But I kind of got it on the ground floor sort of thing. So that was, yeah, that to this day has been my biggest success. Okay, interesting. I put that on everything from journals, notebooks, the planners. Oh, okay. So the one, that one phrase could be repurposed across multiple different sub-niches of low-content books. Exactly. I, I know a lot of people don't like to recycle their covers, but I actually do. And I've done it with a lot of success. So if, if I've got a cover, I, I might use the same cover on a planner because people might want to, to collect them all, right? They might want the get shit done planner and the get shit done notebook. Some people do like to do that. I, you know, I'm one of them. So that tactic has really worked for me and it really helps to just sort of maximize the content that I have. So I'm reusing interiors, which I am customizing, obviously. And then I'm also reusing the covers in all sorts of different niches. Okay. This is fascinating to kind of think of if you can be the first mover on the next <laughs> phrase or the next <laughs> kind of like saying, you know, there, there's an opportunity to capitalize on. 
Exactly. That's why I think looking at memes and, you know, those trends and stuff are, are really, really important to, to stay on top of. Okay. I mean, you can be thinking of what else we could do in this space. So in the KDP space, she's the equivalent to like the 80s bumper sticker that was famous, like crap happens, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's her in the KDP space. <laughs> yeah. But it, I mean, even just stuff like, you know, I had a bunch that say dream big or just kind of takes on on different quotes that you know obviously don't have copyrights behind them but just you know, like I had a lot that said dream big those did well so I think quotes in general as long as you're staying away from anything that's got a copyright behind it obviously why do you think it died off was it just a result of more people kind of seeing the bestseller rank of the get shit done journal planner and then well shoot I'm gonna make a similar one yeah, well, I think for me, most of my planners were obviously seasonal. So when it came to the end of the year, I mean, I was surprised at the amount of mileage I got out of it. It was a 2018 journal. It was still making sales, you know, in Q4, which I had already put up the Get Shit Done 2019 journal. And I, I do an 18 month journal or planner as well. So I, I was still getting great mileage out of it. But people look at the bestseller ranks. I mean, that's what I do. That's how I figure out if there's a niche I want to get into, I want to see if it's selling. So, I mean, other people are doing that too. And, you know, when they see a book that's ranked under a thousand, people want to get in on that action, right? So literally hundreds more planners with that phrase popped up after that. So then it just becomes a matter of things getting a little bit more saturated. <laughs> now it's what's the next to get shit done, right? So <laughs> you kind of always have to try and be ahead of things and try and figure out what that next big thing is. And try not to get in after it's already been played out to that extent. Do you think there comes a point where somebody comes in with the bigger ad budget or the bigger team of virtual assistants and just uploads 10,000? Like they cover every possible phrase and it just wipes out the opportunity that's in this space? I don't see how someone can just do that like like as a blanket. I think there's always going to be new niches popping up, new trends it's just a matter of staying ahead of it, right? Things are a hell of a lot more saturated now than when I started two years ago, but I'm still managing to find little nooks and crannies to get into. And that's, that's where it's at. You know, a lot of people kind of, they don't really know how to do the keyword selection properly. So they're kind of jumping on the bandwagon when it's already kind of already been played out. So I think it's always just about trying to stay ahead of the game and just finding those kind of narrow little niches and it's great to just get super obscure and you know hobbies that no one's ever heard of and just really try to wedge yourself in in those little areas before it gets played out but things are saturated but you just need to pivot and, and go somewhere else i think sure it's, it's like somebody else said recently like okay they can copy us but they don't know where we're going exactly it's yeah. kind of you, you can't you can't really stand still now rob or flav is there a minimum search volume that you're looking for in the merchant words or the uber suggest data or is it just like look if, if five people are searching for this every month i'm going to make it because it doesn't cost you know anything to upload yeah the merchant words thing is a bit of a, a red herring I, I wouldn't recommend anyone sort of rushes out and buys that it's just the way i started but it's really for me i don't know about Flav, but it, it's the bsr and i look honestly anything from zero to two million and that, that's me. And, and then I look at the return. Oh, the other thing is if, if I'm doing a keyword search in Amazon for the book and uh, there's about a few hundred results come in from that keyword and then in the top of the results, there's a book that's selling quite well, say somewhere between 100,000 and a million. And then further down the list, there's not much there. Then that's a kind of good, good niche for me. Yeah, I think kind of like Rachel was saying, I, I'm looking more at kind of like in blogging space where you look for long tail keywords, you know, and to kind of try to get uh, eyeballs that way that instead of going for fitness that has 100,000 searches a month, maybe you find fitness for busy dads. It only has 10,000, but I'm going to own that space. So that's kind of what I look for. So yeah, in my case, as long as I'm seeing some sort of demand there, and I think it's something that, like Rachel said, I can get some sales off of, I, I'll do it. But if there's maybe three people searching for it, that's a different story. But you know, I, I think it all depends, and it's all worth giving it a try. In terms of the interior design or the, the, the content in the low content books, have you found, Flav, anything to help speed up that process? Is it straight blank pages? Is it lines across the page? Is it a prompt at the top of the page? I'm just trying to get a sense of what the interior of these look like, if you can 
upload 300 in a matter of a few months? It depends on the book, right? So if it's a music book, then it's probably going to have staff paper going, you know, blank music sheets. Or if it's a guitar tab book, then it's going to have the little chord boxes at the top and, and staff paper below that music notation. If it's a sketchbook, it kind of has an outline around it. And if it's a line journal, which I know a lot of people get into doing with, with that, then it's just, you know, lined paper. A lot of mine I did early on because I was doing a lot of the lined paper and a lot of the basic ones. But over the last two months, I've just gotten a lot more into the prompt ones. And like Rachel was saying, a little bit more effort on them and the planners and just making sure that I'm putting not just no content, but low content, you know, having some of that information. So instead of having something affirmation journal or something, I take the time to create the boxes myself and and what people might type into those and, and things like that. So if that makes sense, it really depends on the type of book that it is on, on what's going to be inside of it. But I, I do think that that is a barrier to entrance, unlike merch. With merch, you can do a design. I can log into Canva right now and do a simple text design and throw that up on a bunch of shirts. But with KDP, with books in general, you have to craft a good interior that's unique, going to sell and, and all that. And then you got to slap it with a good cover so that it stands out as well in search results. So I think you have two-pronged approach there, whereas with merch, it's only one. Yeah, so you guys both kind of had that merch by Amazon t-shirt design background. Well, Robbie, you're a professional designer, so you had some design background and you had some self-publishing experience too. Now, Rachel, did you have any, I mean, you had self-publishing experience too, but do you have any design experience in coming up with the cover design? Well, I mean, I am actually a designer and an, and an art director by trade. I mean, that that's what I used to do. So I worked as a designer and an art director in advertising for years before. So, so that helps. <laughs> it definitely does help, especially like I'm just at this point now where I can really crank them out. I know the programs well, and I am able to, to create those more complex interiors, which is what I really focus on just to kind of keep the copycats at bay. You know, the more complex I make it, the least likely that someone else is to attempt to try it. It helps me to just be able to customize. You know, there's a lot of people using templates out there, which is fine. But, you know, in order to make mine stand, stand out, I create all my own from custom. So that's been my approach for both the covers and the interiors. One of my struggles with the progress journal was like giving people a preview, like letting people see what the inside actually looks like. And so I ended up for everyone on my email list, just sending them the digital copy. Like, look, I think this is going to be better for you in paperback. But if you want to see what it's going to look like here, you know, you can check it out. And then because on Amazon, like the look inside feature, when I initially uploaded, it didn't get, didn't get far enough into the book to show what the meat of it looked like, the prompt pages look like. You can contact KDP and ask them to show 80% of your look inside, and they will do that. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing. And so now it looks like almost the whole thing is is previewable. Yeah, they, they give you a choice. No, 80% of the book. If you do it, it does it automatic, and it's whatever it is. But you can write them, you can ask up to 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, all the way up to 80%, and they will do exactly what you say. They may You may have to ask them a couple of times, this is Amazon, but that will happen. Yeah. And in my case, though, I think I'd want to show less. I think maybe that's where Nick was going. But like what Rachel was saying, if she does like an intricate interior and I click it and I'm like, "Ooh, this is cool. I'm going to try to redo this. So like what Nick is saying is that I have the ability to see that, to see where her interior is without buying that book. Well, I guess that's <laughs> good. bad, bad for copycats, good for customers. Exactly. Yeah. You know, there are some template services where it's like, okay, you can buy this like pre-packaged thing of, you know, 100 template designs and it's on you to come up with your unique angle. You know, what niche are you going to target with that? And that's one way to go about it. And Amazon will provide, like if you upload the file, they'll like help you with the page margins and the, what they call like the gutter spacing and all this stuff. Because like that can be a headache to get done too. Have you guys, the, the pricing of these, because it's a physical book, there's not as much margin as it as like a digital like download. So is there a sweet spot in terms of price? Does it vary based on the length of the book? What have you guys found? For me, I try to base my price on the royalty. So I try to make sure I get at least a $2 royalty from each book. It's not always possible. The longer books, printed costs go up, so your royalty goes down. So I think my lowest is, is I've got about 70 cents, but I try to keep them around two bucks. So Usually that means my books are priced one to two dollars higher, but because I feel like I've got 
higher quality, I'm okay with that. And I think there is a higher perceived value when something's higher priced. Someone's always going to buy the lowest price product, whatever that is, but some people actually don't want to buy the lowest price because they think it's going to be cheap, right? So people are willing to spend that extra one or two dollars. And at the end of the day, that really makes a huge impact on your monthly royalties, because obviously slapping an extra one or two dollars per book, I mean, that that adds up really, really quickly. So that's just my pricing strategy in general. Yeah, very much a very much a volume game. Do you guys have a, a different strategy? No, my, mine is the same. I try to be at a, a couple dollars per book. And again, it depends on the book, but that's what I try to stick to. Is there anything proactive that you're doing upon publishing to to market this book? Are you running AMS ads? Are you? It's not under your own name, so I imagine it's not like you're building an email list and say, hey, my new journal is out. It's just a total kind of shock and approach. Is there anything you do to market outside of just, well, I'm going to rely on Amazon keyword search? There is an opportunity with ads. I got some ads that are doing well. I, I actually just interviewed a friend of mine who's he started in February, and he's already on 2000 a month now. It's May, and he's just done 1,000 line journals, and he advertises everything. He puts everything on an auto campaign, and if it's cost a dollar and it hasn't sold, he turns off, turns off the campaign. <laughs> he gives it $1 to test, and he's like, that's it. There's no return here. Yeah, and the, and the bid is about 20 cents. And he, he says he's in, the, he's in the green by doing that way, which just freaked me out. But I got one campaign that's doing really well, and it's on a, a logbook that's doing well at the moment. So there is an opportunity there with AMS at the moment, or ad, advertising.amazon.com. And I'm, I'm just starting it, so I'm not an expert there, but I, I think there's something that you, there's quite a lot you can do there. Yeah, I've done something similar, Nick, and, and done some advertising there on Amazon as well to give some of my books a push since I, you know, like I said, I just got serious in January about it. I decided to try to give them push and I've had good results as well and the bids and the cost and everything. But the other thing is I think there is really a nice branding play as well for a few main brands or pen names, whatever you want to call them that I use. I also created like an author central page and made it look very nice, gave it its own, own logo and like a little write-up. So when somebody clicks through to the brand name, number one, they can see all the other titles, but number two, they're also seeing some credibility there as well. And down the line, I haven't done this yet, but down the line, I could also create a Facebook page or even website for those quote unquote brands and then market and do Facebook giveaways or get followers and all that, depending on what that niche is. So, so you really can niche down and really build a brand off of it, I think. Oh, interesting. So you could have guitar guides or something as your brand and then create an author page for that. Is there a limit to how many, quote, authors you can have inside one Amazon publishing account? Yeah, you can have three and then you would need to sign up with another email because it's not tied to your KDP account necessarily. So you can have three. So I have three brand names on one and I have one brand name on another one currently. Oh, cool. And I didn't know you could do that. I do the same thing. I, I try and create a brand. And yeah, I think I've probably got about four or five <laughs> different Author Central pages, but you can also leave a link there to a freebie. So if someone wants to, you know, for me, I do like a free downloadable desktop calendar. So you can do a link to that in your books and you can do that on your author page. So that's a way to actually collect emails. So I haven't been doing that for very long, so I don't have too much experience there yet. But that is a way that you can actually collect emails and then market further on down the line. Because I found after the first year, I just had an email address in there. People were actually emailing me, asking me when the next year's version of that planner was coming out. So you know, I definitely want to take advantage of that. In terms of any paid marketing or other promotion, like I haven't done any of that yet. Haven't really needed to, but I think it's definitely something I'd like to experiment with. But for me right now, just the email collection and then, yeah, the author central page and try and actually build a brand. And if you can collect some emails around that brand, then even better. Okay. And one thing I was trying to do with the progress journal was, okay, as you're three quarters of the way through this journal, you're using the book, you're hopefully seeing some results from it. Hey, your next time block is almost up. Like you should reorder the progress journal for the next one. And I was trying to figure out how to do like a, a coupon offer for that, like get a dollar off or something. And what I found out was you couldn't do that through the KDP system. You had to have it 
through FBA. Like if you if you printed a bunch of copies and like shipped them into Amazon and had them fulfilled, like then you could kind of do some e-commerce coupon type of deal. But it was a, a little bit challenging to go about it that way. Do reviews matter? If I'm launching a physical product and I don't have double digit reviews, like probably nobody is going to buy that thing. Do reviews matter for these books? I mean, they do, but only to a certain extent. Like I don't worry about getting reviews or anything like that. I just let them collect organically. The only time they really matter for me, you know, I look at it in terms of competition. I'm getting into a niche and there's, you know, a bunch of books selling really well, but they all have like a hundred five-star reviews. That will turn me off of that particular niche because it just feels too competitive to me. Other than that, I don't really think too much about them. I'll either get reviews or I won't. And especially with the journals and planners, people love to leave reviews on those and they love to take pictures of what they've done on the inside. So that's actually been really, really cool and something that I didn't really think about before. But yeah, it's great when you go back to one of your books and you see three or four or five reviews with photographs and people are actually showing how they're using the book. Those are kind of the only ways that I really think about reviews. That's cool. And you found that they sell without trying to seed any initial reviews. Yeah, I just don't go there. Amazon is just so strict with trying to get reviews. Like I just I just don't even go there. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole business is, is really about organic. Well, it had up until my flirtation with advertising. It's really all about putting a title up there, getting it selling organically and forgetting about it and moving on to the next one. It's, it's, so, it's so totally the opposite of everything that we've ever done before in that, res- in that regard. Yeah, well, similar to the early days of merch, of the t-shirt business, where it's like, okay, you can upload these designs and just capitalize on this keyword search. And if you happen to show up on the first page and you have a good looking design, I mean, imagine the same thing here. If you've got a good looking cover design and maybe a critical mass of reviews eventually, then you start to make some sales and climb the ranks. On these pages, the, the pages that we're going for, the, the keywords we're going for, maybe none of the results have any reviews. It might be down like that. Or they've got one or two and doesn't make that much difference. What you find is the successful books you have, they end up getting good reviews. And it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure. Imagine you'll find the 80-20 of the ones that sell, but there's a little bit of throwing the proverbial book spaghetti at the wall to see which is going to be the 20% that does sell. So Rob, with the thousand plus titles and now getting into advertising for those books, how do you manage the portfolio or what what percentage of time is spent managing the portfolio versus just coming up with new titles? Or is it just like, hey, throw it up there. If it tells, it tells. If it doesn't, yeah, I'll, I'll try again tomorrow. Well, the advertising is only, I've only just started it. So it, it's really just an acorn at the moment. So it's really about just researching and making more titles and putting them up there and that's that's ninety percent of the work, really. So, and you know, and in terms of managing the portfolio after that, I just look to see what's doing well, and can I work out why that did well, and can I make more titles that do e- even better? Whole portfolio is really just about an information gathering source. Every sale is is a bit of information, you know. It teaches you about what sales on Amazon. And so it's just it's just about that rinse and repeat, make more books, make more books, make more books, get more ideas, make them better, make them better, make them better. That That's really just it. Flav, what about you? Any tips or tricks for managing this type of volume of content? You know, for me so far, I utilize Airtable to have all my titles. The same thing I do for merch. It's a software called Merch Wizard that I use for merch and i highly recommend those guys and they came up with a program for kdp it's in beta currently so it's in its infancy but it's called kdp wizard and for that program really all it does is it it automatically puts all my books into an air table which is basically for anyone who has not used Airtable, it's just basically like Excel, only it allows you to put attachments and things like that. So I can store my interiors in there and everything I need into one place. So for me, Nick, it's been pretty easy using that. And then prior to that coming along, I didn't have tons of titles to worry about it. So for me, I, I organize it using that right now. Rachel, anything to add on on that front? No, I mean, now I'm trying to focus a little bit more on quality over quantity. And now I've got a bit of a better idea of what sells and what doesn't. I'm trying not to pump out as many books so I can keep closer tabs on them. And then, you know, I can just go in and shift some keywords around if I want to or or categories or things like that. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think, you know, a lot of people getting into this want to, like Nick was saying, trying to pump out like thousands upon thousands. My end game is not to have 20,000 books out there trying to make me a little bit of money. You know, my my end game is to have quality books out there that have good reviews, a good amount of organic sales ads and are generating a good amount of revenue, therefore making it easier to to manage. And like Rachel said, go back and change things and pump out similar ones. But yeah, I think quality over quantity is going to be the answer in this industry as people get into this kind of space here. Yeah, imagine they may Amazon may start throttling accounts like they have with with merch, or they may say, "Hey, if it doesn't sell within sixty days, we're taking it off our platform." Like, even though it's just ones and zeros, it's like, "Hey, you're clogging up our database somewhere over here." Flav, do you have a a goal by the end of the year, like to get to two grand a month, or like where do you see this going? Yeah, by the end of the year, I'd like to be. Which I mean, we're already halfway through, I suppose. So by the end of the year, I'd like to be at twenty five hundred plus as my kind of moving average per month. And like Rachel said, I'm sure that some months I'll probably do more than that and others way less than that. But I'm going into the new year next year, I'm looking to my average to be 2,500 or more a month. Do you see it being a a full-time thing eventually? Or is it like, hey, this is just the next gold rush that I'm going to take advantage of it while the getting is good and then on to the next thing? Well, for me, I I enjoy doing it. I really do. So for me, I think it'll be a while that I keep doing it. And in my case, I also have wanted to get into self-publishing for a while in terms of written books, nonfiction and fiction. So I, I think the rest of this year, I'll also be exploring that into possibly putting that into into what I'm doing for next year. Sounds good. Rachel, you've got the newborn at home. What's your time commitment look like or where do you want to uh, go with it this year? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'd like to at least make what I made last year. So I've, I've still got my heart set on the six figure. I've got a lot of catching up to do, but yeah, I do have a baby at home. So I've got to be a little bit realistic with my time. I'm managing to get about 20 hours in right now across all of my projects. So time commitment wise, I'm putting 12 hours a week toward this. And really over the last few years, it's been kind of a, a few hours a week type of a thing anyways. So right now, yeah, I, I'm just trying to keep things going. And like I said, got to be a little bit realistic with the baby, but yeah, my goal is still six figures by the end of the year. So. Very cool. I like it. And it's one of these businesses where you kind of put in the research, you put in the effort, you put in the time up front, and then now you have these little mini assets that are going out into the world and, and can serve you and can make sales and, and pay you kind of passive royalties from there. Now, Rob, where are you going? Are you going to the 20,000 book level? What are you, what are you doing this year? Well, I kind of said, well, the one thing I'm surprised we haven't talked about yet is, is, is Q4. That was really what got me at the end of last year. I mean, I was just, by October or September, I was sort of splattering and maybe making a few hundred bucks a, a month. And by the end of December, it was it was nearly 4,000. Christmas was, just, I mean, it must be for you, you guys as well. It's just, I had never seen anything like it. You know, it was, they were flying off the shelves and, so um, I see my this year as just building up to that November. It starts halfway through the November and December. And I've got sort of targets in, in my mind, but I've got obviously other things to do on my business, with my business. It's not the, the whole of the business. and I'm, it's, It isn't for anyone. It's nice. I really enjoy it. Same as the other guys. There's something about it because it's got the, it's got the creative element to it. I think that's it. And then there's the the element of it's great fun to get one over on the Amazon algorithm. You know, it's just fun. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) Well, very cool, guys. Really appreciate you kind of diving into this with me and exploring this really low barrier to entry side hustle that people can get started with really right away. Kind of going down for Flav's advice, you know, starting with what you know and kind of spidering out from there. If you guys want to learn more about our esteemed panel of guests, you can do so. Rob is at robcubbin.com. He's got a really, I find, an interesting blog over there, robcubbin.com. Flav is at sidebusinesslaunch.com. If you hit sidebusinesslaunch.com slash book hustle, that's his landing page where he teaches a course on how to dive deeper into this subject. And Rachel is at rachelharrisonsund.com. Kind of an honest look inside and out of this business. Like I said, I recommend checking out the income from the roller coaster income reports, reading about getting the account shut down, always a risk playing in somebody else's sandbox, but some interesting stuff over there. All three of you guys really appreciate you joining me. 
if you don't mind, I would love to do a roundup of number one tips for Side Hustle Nation, as is tradition. So, Rob, can you wrap us up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation? Doesn't have to be self-publishing related, whatever entrepreneurial wisdom you want to impart. I wonder what it was in 2014. I just looked this up. Do you want me to tell you? <laughs> I'll tell you my tip first, if it's the same. My tip for anyone who watches Nick's show or listens to Nick's show or has anything to do with Nick is to not go for money. Go for the love and the enjoyment of what you're doing and the money will come. Is that, is that what I said in 2014? Probably not. No, in 2014, it was... It was keep the products coming, which sounds like, hey, I'm very much following the same strategy even five years later. Oh, yeah. I was, in, I was big into consistency at the time. Yeah. Flav, what about you? For me, I would say if you do get into this, uh, we didn't even touch on this, but I'll put it out there, is that with these journals and books and, and things in general, you can sell almost anywhere besides finding a manufacturer to do them physically. There's a lot of POD providers that do them. So you can really build a brand like Rachel and I were talking about. You can sell them on Etsy. It doesn't have to be KDP. So if you know having an Etsy shop is your thing, there's a huge market for these out there that you can sell them on or on your own Shopify site and build in a brand just like you would a blog and everything. For instance, if you're going to do planners and you're going to talk about productivity, then you can have a blog and content all around that and get some SEO and, and ads and Facebook page and everything all around it. So in other words, just think big. KDP is certainly a great platform. We all like it there, but think beyond that because I know that's what I'll be doing in the future, kind of increasing that footprint to other places. Is there a specific tool or service that you like for that syndication to Etsy and these other platforms? There's a couple of them I can think of off the top of my head. Guten is a good place to go as well as T-Launch. I've had some success with T-Launch for apparel and I do know they do journals. They're, you know, they're a little more basic in what they offer there, but that certainly can get you started on selling them on Etsy. <laughs> gluten like the wheat protein or gluten like Glutenberg? Uh, gluten, uh, G-O-O-T-E-N. Okay. Printify, I believe, does to Etsy is another book. PID business. Printify, okay. And I'm sure there's going to be more and more popping up as as this you know gets out there. But but yeah, there's a lot of different avenues to do it. But I would just say think big, build a brand. And just like the self-publishing rush for written books about 10 years ago, the ones that are still standing today are the ones that have built a brand and a name for themselves and, and, and all that. So I, I think this will be the same too. Yeah. Now that's an interesting angle. Thank you for bringing that up. Rob or Rachel, have you had any experience in syndicating your top sellers to other platforms? Not yet, but it's definitely, it's on my list. It's definitely something that I'm going to explore, especially as more and people, more and more people get into this part of that, you know, staying ahead of the curve thing. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's really cool. Lots of different ways that you can go just outside of Amazon and, and on Amazon. Rachel, how about a number one tip from you? Yeah. So just in general, I think, you know, I just want to say to people, no matter what it is you're doing, don't give up at the first sign of challenge, which I see so many people do. When it comes to who's successful and who's not, I think the only real difference is that successful people, they just keep going when things get tough. So I just think people need to decide on what they want, find out what it takes to get there, and then keep working at it relentlessly until you do. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's why we are all still standing <laughs> because we have kept going at that sign of challenges. And we know we've had lots uh, along the way. So really, Appreciate you guys joining me again, rachelharrisonsund.com for Rachel, robcubbin.com, and sidebusinesslaunch.com. Thanks, guys, and we'll catch up with you soon. All right, my top three takeaways from this call with Rob, Flav, and Rachel. Number one is it starts with one. It starts with one book. For all of these panelists, before they had their portfolios of dozens or hundreds of titles, it started with one upload. So do your homework, design the cover, lay out the interior. There are a ton of tools to help you do just that. Amazon has a cool paperback cover design template file that will tell you all the dimensions that you need. I actually make my paperback covers in PowerPoint for the progress journal. I hired someone on Fiverr to help format the interior pages. And I think it was like 40 bucks in total. That one was kind of awesome. She, she told me she was actually a listener of the show and would listen while she was doing her formatting work. But it starts with one. It's never going to take longer than that first upload. And with any luck, you'll be able to repurpose some of the interior pages and prompts and that kind of design. But go through the process. This is putting a digital asset of yours out into the world 
where it's easy for someone to buy it. If you've never done it before, it could be your first buy button on the internet. It's a chance to make a sale. We talk about this all the time in our house, especially when it comes to the merch by Amazon, side hustle, the t-shirt business. Are designs the best in the world? Of course not, but they're out there and they're making sales, which leads me to takeaway number two, which is don't overthink it. Obviously, you want to create a quality product that's actually helpful for people, but this is a unique take on self-publishing where speed to market and speed of adding new products probably trumps your need to make each individual one 100% perfect. A friend of ours is that perfectionist artist type who probably cringes when she sees some of the designs that we've uploaded. And again, this is t-shirts and not low content books yet, but nobody's going to buy something they don't like. And a killer idea or design that remains in your head is never going to make you any money. Now, as you heard though, the low content publishing business is, it's a bit of a shotgun business where you'll probably need to upload several titles or even several dozen titles to begin to see what's working and what's not. Once you have that sales data, that's when I think it makes sense to go back and perfect any issues that are bothering you with the books that are now proven to sell. There's likely to be an 80-20 distribution to this where a handful of books end up outperforming the rest. Like you heard from Rachel, a single title was worth thousands of dollars a month. But are you going to hit that home run on your first at bat? Maybe, but probably not. So so don't overthink it. And takeaway number three for me was to think about branding and expansion. Like where else could you take this? As this gold rush of a side hustle matures, I think the players who will have sustainable businesses are those who've built reputable brand names, are those who can afford to proactively market their titles, and those who are selling on platforms outside of just Amazon. I went into this call, honestly, a little skeptical of the business. Like, okay, you, you're going to upload a bunch of stuff and maybe some of it sells. Is that worth the effort? But Rob, Flop, and Rachel convinced me there's a lot more to it than that, and definitely some cool ways to hedge against the inevitable flood of competition. Plus, there's always new niches opening up, especially targeting, like Rachel did, certain phrases and memes from the popular lexicon. Consider low-content publishing another tool to add to your side hustle toolbox potentially a new income stream to try and cultivate. Once again, notes and links for this episode are at sidehustlenation.com slash low, L-O-W, and there you'll find all of our esteemed panelists and also be able to download the free PDF highlight reel summary from this episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen and I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.